is that we're we're in a decade of shortages. You know, you can't neglect primary resources and industries, and they need capital. And so you have this nice proxy. You can kind of peek in and say, well, are we tending to this industry or not? And the capex cuts over the last ten years, because of the capex boom in the in the ten years prior to that, were so dramatic that um, that you're seeing a supply response now. So there's one way out of this, and that's to recapitalize the industry, get the share prices up, which allows capital to come back in, and that allows the industry to get going again. And until you get there, you're going to have a decade of shortages. And between now and then, you're going to have an unbelievable return we expect for investors looking at this space. On this episode of What the Finance Podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming on, welcoming on Adam Rosenswag, who's managing partner and uh, of Goering and Rosenswag. So Adam, thanks so much for coming to the podcast today. No, oh, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. No problem. I'm looking forward to the conversation because, yeah, I guess uh, energy has been one of those topics that's just been thrown around quite a lot over the past few years. And uh, I guess a lot of people are thinking that maybe it's gone to the wayside now that it's not as uh, important. But I guess for, from your perspective, what do you currently see in the markets? Are you... Do you still think it has that importance and there's going to be lots of movement in the near term or what are your thoughts? Yeah, we think that energy is probably going to be the most important investment theme of the next seven or eight years. And, and really the reason and the rationale behind that is that we have brutally undercapitalized this industry for the better part of you know a decade now. And you have to go back really all the way, almost 20 years ago, there was a really big concern that we were running out of oil, the idea of Hubbard's peak and peak oil and stuff like that. And that resulted in a big price spike um, back in, you know, 2007, 2008, oil hit $145 a barrel. And, and it, it created a huge mania in oil shares, oil stocks in the S&P were about, you know, 20% of the S&P at that point, double their long-term average. Um, a lot of money got spent, a lot of exploration got done. And as is not always the case, but this time it was, it hit. And what it hit and what it brought online was, of course, the shales. And the shales were unbelievably revolutionary. Uh, it was a new way of liberating oil from rock that was previously not possible to produce. Now, all of a sudden, it was. And we brought on some major, major gusher fields in the United States. On the gas side of things, we brought on the Haynesville down in East Texas. We brought on the Marcellus up in Pennsylvania and parts of Ohio. Uh, and then we also brought on associated gas from both the Eagleford and the Permian, which is to say gas produced in an oil field uh, still produces some gas. And the oil fields that we brought on were so prolific that the you know byproduct gas that it brought up was actually enough to move the needle as well. So on the oil side, we did the Bakken in North Dakota, the Eagleford in South Texas, and the mother of all shales, the Permian Basin in West Texas. And how big were all those? Well, together on the oil side of things, you brought on about 10 million barrels a day of liquids production. That's as much as Saudi Arabia produces. And on the gas side of things, you brought on, you know, 90 BCF a day of gas, basically. And again, you have to, for those that aren't familiar with the energy markets, you can convert natural gas into oil barrel equivalents based on the content of the energy that each unit has. You divide it by six. And so take 90 divided by six, you know, you're talking about 13, 14 million barrels equivalent there. So that's like another Saudi Arabia. So we brought on two Saudi Arabias in the same country in the same decade. And that was enough to really push the oil markets and the gas markets into surplus. Prices fell quite dramatically. And for a period of time, investors just ran the other way. Of course, this was all being done under the backdrop of renewables and EVs. And so the idea was that we'll never, never, never need oil again, never need gas again. And it resulted in a couple really bizarre situations. Uh, it resulted in a, a whole number of newspaper articles, magazine cover stories calling for the death of oil. It resulted in at its extreme oil prices turning negative for a day where you had to actually pay somebody up to $40 a barrel and just to take the oil. You, know, you couldn't you couldn't sell it. You couldn't give it away. You had to pay someone to cart it off. We're not really sure that that actually ever happened, but certainly on paper it happened. And um, from its peak of 20 something percent of the S&P, oil and gas stocks got down to 1.9 percent of the S&P 500 in the, in the second quarter of 2020. So unbelievable swings. And the truth of the matter is, that the oil business is very cyclical and it's very cyclical based on a capital cycle. And when you starve the industry for capital, what happens is it slowly starts to deplete. It has a 
asset base. It has a production base. But unless you reinvest all the time, you can't overcome that depletion. So it doesn't happen in the first year that you cut back CapEx. It doesn't happen in the second. But by the seventh or eighth, which is kind of where we are right now, we're starting to see that really bite. And I think that means that we're going from a period now where oil assets are going to be considered or have gone from being considered uninvestable to being must own. And it's happening right before our eyes. And that's going to take another seven or eight years to run its course. Okay, wow, that, that, that's really interesting to hear. So is this really just a CapEx factor or is it also maybe a geopolitical factor where there's a, all, all this concerns about, I guess, yeah, obviously fuels and, and oil and, and energy from different parts of the world? Well, so I think I think it really is first and foremost a CapEx issue here. And, you know, when you look at how much money has been pulled back and out of the space, uh, it's really dramatic. Now, what's interesting, more than a geopolitical issue, which we could talk about for a long time and is equally interesting too, I'm sure, but is sort of a geological issue. And what I mean by that is there's not a clear next basin to bring online here, shale, conventional or deep water or otherwise. You know, there's pockets here and there, but it's not immediately obvious to me anyway. If you were to give the industry a ton of money tomorrow, would that really bring on a lot of oil in the near term? Now, I'm not willing to say that it won't because typically, you know, it's not good to bet against the ingenuity of the energy industry. They'll figure it out. They'll go and explore. But it's probably not going to be quick and it's probably not going to be relatively cheap. It's probably going to be expensive oil um, unless someone gets really lucky and figures out, you know, a new discovery that that's really off of people's radar screens. So, so I think that the first and foremost thing that, that I'm looking at is a capital issue. The second thing, which I think is kind of interesting and, and lurking in the background is this geological issue. Have we now gotten actually closer um, to, to having produced most of the large, easy, accessible oil fields, kind of like we thought we were back in the middle 2000s, right before the shells came online? It's an interesting question. I think we might be, but I'm not. I'm not willing to make that the full uh, basis of the investment thesis just yet. Uh, and then, of course, you know, geopolitics and geopolitics are about as complicated now as I can ever remember them. There's typically thought to be a you know what they call like a conflict premium in the oil price, and that can either be there or it's not there. And then people get around and argue whether or not it's justified or too low or too high. So does does today's you know huge tensions in both now, you know, two theaters, both in Russia and Ukraine and now in the Middle East. Does that warrant the current conflict premium? I mean, who, who knows? But what I can tell you is that things are as complicated now as I have seen them. Um, if you think of, you know, the the uh, situation happening in Israel, um, you're, you're drawing in now potentially uh, Iran, Russia by proxy, Saudi Arabia, which was close, very close to negotiating peace or, or recognition with Israel uh, before this, before the Hamas terror attacks happened on October the 7th, and the United States. And that, that's like 48% of the world's oil supply. Now, nothing's actually really happening in, with any of those players now, but, but it's definitely um, as complicated and as tenuous as I remember it from an oil market perspective. Um, and then the other thing that's happened in, in the backdrop of all that is that after the oil embargoes, the OPEC oil embargoes of the 1970s, the Western world, and notably the United States, amassed a really big reserve of strategic petroleum, what they call the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And that was supposed to try to dissuade any bad actors from using an oil embargo as a weapon. The argument being that we had a 750 million barrels stashed away. And so if you were going to try to cut off our oil supply, we would be able to make it a really long time. And it would hurt you because you wouldn't have oil revenue and it would hurt us because we wouldn't have supplies. But we had more of a stockpile of oil reserves than you had a stockpile of dollar reserves. And so ultimately it would be difficult to use that as a weapon again. That's now been drawn down by about 50% last year alone. Uh, and that was done the first was following Russia and Ukraine. The Biden administration decided to release a whole bunch of oil from the SPR. The second was right before the midterm elections to try to put a cap on oil price. And then the third was part of a spending bill that actually required the Congress to sell oil out of the SPR. But the net result is that now the SPR is only 350 million barrels, not 700. So it's not zero. It still exists. But we're more vulnerable today to disruptions than we have been at any time in the past 20 years. 
with the US, if I'm not mistaken, they're a net exporter of, of oil. So, so would that really impact them if there were these uh, sort of, um, yeah, as you said, um, embargoes or would it be more, I guess, the effects on the rest of the world? Well, so I think, I think, so first of all, you know, the, the U S became a net exporter for, for a few months. Uh, and, and now, you know, we're, we're back and, and we never became a, a total gross exporter. So we, we were exporting and importing always. And that's because of how the refinery systems are set up in this country. Um, but no, the, the U S still relies on, uh, imports, gross imports of crude oil. And I think if you were to get a disruption that would massively disrupt, um, the oil balances in this country. So that that's definitely true. The other thing, of course, is that, you know, the, the only source of non-OPEC growth for the last 15 years has been the U.S. shales. And for the last five years, the only source of non-OPEC growth has been seven or eight counties in West Texas. I mean, that's a really narrow shoulder to be to be standing on. We've never seen that before. Everywhere else in the non-OPEC world, on balance, net has been in decline. And in the U.S. of the shales, two out of the three big ones, the Bakken and the Eagleford, have been in decline. So the question is, well, how much can the Permian grow, right? Because that's really been the only thing that's keeping the global non-OPEC oil markets balanced. And people don't even realize for the last four months, the sequential month-on-month declines in the Permian have been negative. The Permian has stopped growing. And we've been flagging this as a potential warning going back, I don't know, three or four years now. Um, and it's because you've drilled the best wells in that. They're done. They're finished. They're they're drilled up really, really tightly. There's not a lot uh, left to go. And what you are drilling is now less and less and less productive. And so I think you're in a position where OPEC is now going to regain market power, market share. With that, they're going to get pricing power. And the U.S. is basically as um, vulnerable from its SPR perspective as it has been in recent memory. Yeah, it's great, crazy thing. So if we look at the current markets, would you say it's it's quite tight? As you said, if there's any issues in parts of the world, then we could see this, um, yeah, as you said, tight tightness. Is that right. what you're saying? You're tight. It's tight right now. The only thing that's been, that's been um, confusing things has been the release from the SPR. And analysts, for whatever reason, and journalists, for whatever reason, they, they tend to really be fixated on commercial inventories of oil. And so if commercial inventories of oil go up, there's sort of a view that the market's in surplus. And if it goes down, there's a view that the market's in deficit. And normally that makes sense because the strategic reserves stay pretty flat. But what happens when you start, like, let's say you started adding to the SPR. Is that considered new demand or is that just considered reclassifying commercial inventories into government inventories and you know net neutral? The market tends to treat it as new demand. Uh, conversely, if the SPR starts releasing oil, and you move that from the government stockpiles into the commercial stockpiles, has that the same as a new oil field coming online? Or are you just kind of erasing one name and writing on another? The market tends to think of it as a new oil field coming online. And so that's kind of been the situation we've been in for the last year. We've become addicted to SPR releases. They're done now. We haven't released anything since June. And that's when prices have been moving higher. So I don't think that's any coincidence. I think it's really short-sighted on the part of investors and analysts but you know let that be your let that be all of our advantages to go and, and use that short-sightedness as a buying opportunity yeah definitely so do you, do you see what, what are your odds of say not maybe not an embargo but there being sort of further escalations and, and risks from a lot of these oil producers in the middle east or russia or other parts of the world oh i have no idea and i don't think anybody does I, th- I think you have some of the bright- brightest minds in the whole world and some of the brightest intelligence communities in the whole world working on what's going to happen next. And I don't think anyone has a clue. So I think I think what's more important is you have to take a step back, as, as always is the case with OPEC and with geopolitics. And you kind of have to look at what the demand picture looks like, which, believe it or not, even though everyone talks about demand being weak, we don't see it coming through in the numbers. And then you have to look at other sources of supply that are not subject to geopolitics, that are more market based. Um, you know, the notable one being the U.S. shales, which has been able to deliver, you know, 10 million barrels over the last decade. I mean, it, that, that's astounding. We've, ne- we've never had anything like that. You know, the shales for a period of time there felt like you could almost ask them to do anything. You know, there's a period of time where prices fell, people stopped drilling rigs, and yet still production was moving higher and higher and higher. Uh, and there's this view that you, you know, had almost a limitless supply of, of, of hydrocarbon coming out of the U.S. And so it's led to everyone really everyone just basically you know ignoring it and stop had to pay attention to issues of supply 
and issues of balances. And I think that's going to be to everyone's detriment. So instead of focusing on the geopolitics and instead of trying to say what's going to happen next with Israel and what's going to happen next with Iran, you know, I think the important thing to look at is what's happening to the global non-OPEC sources of oil supply. And if those are starting to get really tight, then, you know, it's kind of like chaos theory. You, you can almost, you know, you predict that something's going to happen somewhere that's going to disrupt the remaining OPEC supplies. And that, that, that's been true for a long time. Like you could do that for, for a long time. You know, if, if you had cushion in the system, then you'd have outages in parts of the Middle East and no one, no one cared. And then other times, you know, the market was really tight and you'd have a really small change and people would freak out about it. I'll give you a really great example. In 2018, Iranian uh, rebel groups, the Houthi rebels, uh, use drones and missiles to take out 4 million barrels a day from Saudi's refining complex, 4 million barrels a day. That's massive. Oil prices spiked on the news and a week later they were lower than before the attack, even though that all that infrastructure was offline for a couple months. You know, that, that was a major, major, major escalation in the region and the oil market just shrugged it off. A, a couple years after that maybe was I have to go back and look at the notes, but you know, there's all those attacks on ships in the Straits of Hormuz, and the Straits of Hormuz were blocked for you know a short period of time. Again, that that is like from an oil infrastructure bottleneck risk assessment. That's red, red, red. You know, that that is your uh, artery into the world shipping channels for you know the vast majority of seaborne crude. Uh, oil prices shrugged it off because there was still ample buffer in the system there's no buffer now so where's where's the next problem going to come from i i don't know but when you have a really tight market you're almost assured it'll come from somewhere so as you said what happens if we with, with no buffer is that does that just mean a lot more volatility a lot more of these yeah yeah very quick think, mass moves I, th I think i think the risk is a price spike i think the risk is a price spike you know over and above a natural long-term equilibrium price um I, I think you i think you have to be prepared for that so you know we're pretty straightforward when it comes to being investors. We like to do all this research, understand the trends, and then put on uh, stock investments that'll take advantage of this over a five-year period, right? So so for us, we're very, very bullish of energy. Um, and we have names that should respond to that rise in the oil price over time. But, you know, if you're a trader and you're, you know, ha have have all kinds of more complicated volatility strategies and tail risks and stuff like that, I think, I think you have to be prepared for, for, volatility upside and mostly upside volatility okay so before you're saying you know it's key to track sort of demand and supply so if we look at demand is it really just looking at the us and china are those the key two key drivers drivers of that yeah i mean i think those are two key drivers they're not everything though you know you're seeing really strong demand growth coming from india which has gone from basically nothing to being the third largest or second largest rather line item of growth in the iea's year on year balance sheets for for demand um you know, big parts of Southeast Asia, uh, which have, you know, very, very dense population centers, which people certainly in America don't appreciate. And I'm not sure what the feeling is in London, but, you know, like Indonesia is a massive, massive country seeing substantial and strong sustained oil uh, and energy demand growth. Um, and, and really, it's it, it's it's more widespread than people would realize. But yeah, clearly, you know, the United States and China are big contributors to global oil demand and India has now become a big contributor to growth. Okay, makes sense. And then if, if we go to, I guess, gas markets, um, what, what are you seeing there? Is, is the real factor just what's happening in Europe at the moment? I, I think the biggest dynamic that's in the gas market today is what's happening in the United States, actually, more than in Europe. So it, it's being it's related to Europe. It's being driven to a certain degree by Europe. But I think it's actually the U.S. gas market you have to really pay close attention to. And the reason I say that is that in the United States, natural gas prices trade, they got as low as two bucks, and now they're flirting with three. And in Europe, they're about 15 or 16, and in Asia, they're 20. Oil, you know, you multiply three by six to get the oil equivalent. So that would be $18 a barrel oil with global crude trading at 90 bucks. Uh, coal prices, you know, are, are dramatically more expensive. US natural gas is by far the cheapest molecule of energy on planet Earth by like 
to 80%. And the reason is that you can't access the global market because we have more gas here than we have ability to export. You know, gas is not as easy to export as oil because it's a gas. So you have to cool it down, put it in LNG tankers, and it's a very specialized process. So we have more gas, even though the US has gone from being the world's largest importer of LNG to the world's largest unexpected exporter of LNG in a period of 10 or 15 years, we still have more gas then we have the ability to export. And so we have a dislocation in price. And in the United States, prices are, are super, super cheap. However, we have six Bs of new LNG export capacity coming online in the next 18 months. And you want to guess what gas supply is growing here in the US? By a lot of measures, it's flat over the last 18 months or so. So again, you had this really warm winter in Europe. You had this really warm winter in the US. And you actually had an LNG export terminal catch fire last year. And because of those things, inventories have kind of backed up a little bit and they're not quite as low as they were last year around this time. So everyone has this like unbelievable sense of complacency and oil or gas rather in the United States is able to trade at the oil equivalent of $18 a barrel with the rest of the world's pricing closer to $100 a barrel. It can't last. And I think that we finally see a line of sight to that ending. We've been out of the gas market for a long time and then we got back in when we finally said we think that supply here has run its course. And since then, supply really has. We haven't seen much in the way of growth at all. How much would we need to get in order to fill all that LNG export? You'd need to basically have the next two years be like the most prolific shale growth years ever. And it's just not, I don't see why anyone would bet on that happening. So could gas prices in the US go from three to eight bucks, three to six, three to 10? Yeah. Totally. And I think I can't really see another market where that happens. You know, oil is not going to go from 90 to 400. Um, uranium might go from 70 to 500. Uh, but but that's about it. You know, I, I don't see anything else doing that uh, in the near term, whereas gas, I think, could do it in, in a six month period if, if the conditions are right. It'll all depend on the winter this winter. If you get another super warm winter through Europe, everything gets pushed out. If you have a normal winter, it could be as early as the spring that this starts to really get get tight. Yeah, and as you say, if there's any, I guess, issues with uh, facilities to, to export it, and then it just goes back to being really cheap. <laughs> I suppose so. I mean, yeah, you know, again, like we try to be long-term investors. So I think if a temporary fire at a Freeport LNG facility tanks the gas price and makes our gas investments go down, I would try to buy as many as I could in that situation. That's what we did. Yeah, okay, makes sense. So if we look at your investments, are you really focusing on, I guess, uh, you know, if you can talk about them, um, us and i guess a more upstream focused companies rather than midstream and downstream we do tend to focus on the upstream and and really the rationale there is you know s some people prefer the midstream and the downstream or the large integrated companies or the large diversified companies because they feel that they can get some resource exposure while hedging out if you will or diversifying out some of the commodity price risk we're a little bit different we think that the way to do it is to do it tremendous amount of work at the commodity level, understand which ones you think are going up and then get good direct exposure to that trend. And so we're looking for that exposure. We're not trying to shy away from it. And so a lot of times the midstream and the downstream guys, you know, are relatively insulated from moves in the commodity price. Uh, and so, you know, that's not our preferred way to do it. We do tend to prefer upstream direct exposure. Uh, when I say direct, I mean, we, we buy the listed shares, but we like things that have a really clear cut exposure to the commodities we want. And um, is it mostly in the U.S.? You know, our mandate's global. Realistically, you know, a lot of energy assets are listed in the U.S. and a lot of mining assets are listed in Canada. Uh, and then a bunch are listed in Australia and some in London. So that tends to be where our holdings are as well. But the assets are all global. Okay, that makes sense. And you mentioned uranium before and how it could go from its current price to, what did you say, 70 to 400? So I'm not sure. I know you have uh, quite a lot, done a lot of research in there and sort of done a, uh, I watched an interview where you talked about like the whole past hundred years of the uranium market. So I'm not, you don't have to go into that, but yeah, I'm not sure if you want to talk about more about that and why you think it could be have yeah, that so, volatility. Yeah, you, you know, uranium... I do think I have to go to the last hundred years. I'm sorry. I'll try to go through them quite quickly. But, you know, from the time that that we first split the atom till basically 2006, we produced more uranium than our nuclear electricity reactors consumed. And a bunch of that went into weapons, a bunch of that went into government stockpiles, and some of it went into commercial stockpiles. And beginning in 1983, the governments all got together and they said, this is a bit much. You know, let's start to reclassify our government stockpiles as just commercial stockpiles, make it available to the utilities. And we can actually even start to downblend 
some of our weapons, turn it from highly enriched uranium down to low enriched uranium, which is more suitable for, or is suitable for the reactor fleet. And that resulted in this big overhang and mine supply shut down. The U.S. went from producing 40 million pounds a year to nothing. And um, we drew down the stockpiles ever since. And beginning in the early 2000s or the, maybe 2005, there's a view that, well, maybe we've run out of these stockpiles. Maybe for the first time, the natural deficit, meaning mine supply without the stockpiles relative to reactor demand is going to come to the fore. And prices spiked. They went from nine to 150 bucks. And then Fukushima happened. We shut down 30% of the world's reactors and stockpiles, as you would expect, started to grow again. Well, in 2018, that switched back into a primary deficit meaning the stockpile stopped growing and they actually started declining. Our mine supply was not enough to meet reactor demand. And that's still true today. The question is, when are the stockpiles running out? And we made the case a couple of years ago that we think it's happening right as we speak. And so now prices fell from 150 way back in 2007, all the way down to uh, $19 by 2018. That's when we got involved. Today, prices are about 73 so they're starting to move up. They're starting to move up quite sharply now. There's some reasons for that. Speculators are getting back into the market, but it's also because for really the first time since we split the atom, we see a sustainable, persistent deficit in the uranium market over the next five years until mine supply can catch up. And so with that, I think that you're going to have higher prices. Now, how high could prices go? Well, what's interesting about nuclear power is that once you've built a nuclear reactor, the incremental cost to feed it with fuel is very, very low. So you would almost pay anything once you've built that reactor. And in fact, you know, given commissioning issues and given, you know, what you do with, with reactor cores, you almost can't take it offline. You compare and contrast that to like a coal plant or a gas plant, which are pretty cheap to spin up, but then you have a lot of operating costs in the form of fuel, uranium is very different. So what would you pay if you were a fuel buyer and you didn't have fuel locked there? What would you pay? Could you pay 100? Easily. Could you pay 200? Easily. Could you pay 500? You probably could. And so now with uranium at 500 bucks, you'd start to bring on an awful lot of mine supply and that would spell the end of that bull market. So that's not what we're using for modeling purposes, but you could see a spike. You definitely could see a spike because I think at this point, the idea of bringing on reactor demand fast enough is going to be very, very challenging. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, bringing on mine yeah. supply fast enough to meet reactor demand will be very challenging. Okay. And are there any, I guess, yeah, as you said, mines that are scheduled to come online in, in the near term? Yeah, there are. You know, so you have ARA, which is a project by NextGen up in Canada and Saskatchewan, uh, as well as uh, Denison has the Wheeler River project. Those are both due to come online, but, you know, Next Gen says 2027. I think that's really optimistic. We own the stock, so full disclosure, but we own Denison as well. But so I think it's going to be tough to bring it on before 2028 or 2029. Um, so you 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 do have this window. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So if we go from the energy uh, markets to, I guess, our, our other commodities, is there anything else that you're paying attention to at the moment or keeping an eye well, on? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we have, we're very... We have core positions in oil, gas, and uranium, and we have secondary positions or half positions in copper and in gold. And we can save that for you know maybe our next podcast because I could talk for another hour on both of those. But suffice to say, on the gold side, that's probably the most hated, um, the most hated um, commodity out there right now. Gold stocks regularly trade as low as two or three times earnings. Uh, there's been never a commodity bull market which I think we're in now that hasn't had major gold leadership. The question has always been timing and, you know, it doesn't always work at all periods of the cycle. Sometimes it's later stage. If you look back in the 1970s, which I think we're in right now, a repeat of that, then, you know, gold, you wanted to own that post 74 or not kind of in the early years. I think we're going to see a repeat there too. We've printed so much debt in the world that, that, you know, gold is going to re-rate higher and the gold stocks are going to be wonderful performers. The question is when and the timing. And so I think that that's the next one to watch, you know, if you're looking at three, four or five years, particularly if you get a spike in energy and energy shares. Yeah, that makes sense. So Adam, thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, my last question is, what is one message you'd like people to take away from our conversation? Well, I think the message here is that we're, we're in a decade of shortages. You know, you can't neglect primary resources and industries and they need capital. And so you have this nice proxy. You can kind of peek in and say, well, are we tending to this industry or not? And the CapEx cuts over the last 10 years 
because of the capex boom in the in the 10 years prior to that were so dramatic that um that you're seeing a supply response now so there's one way out of this and that's to recapitalize the industry get the share prices up which allows capital to come back in and that allows the industry to get going again until you get there you're gonna have a decade of shortages and between now and then you're gonna have an unbelievable return we expect for investors looking at this space okay makes sense so, yep yeah, adam thanks again for your time i really appreciate it uh if anyone wanted to find out more about your work and what you do where would the best places for that be our website is uh, just type in Gehring and Rosenzweigen. What's nice about our name is if you get even halfway there, Google will figure it out for you. Our website is gorosen, G-O-R-O-Z-E-N.com. Perfect. I'll pull that in the description below, but thanks again for your time. Thank you so much. Have a nice weekend. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.